Greetings and welcome to the latest edition of the Entheogenic Evolution Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Martin, and I'm happy to have you with me today as we travel back in time so long ago to last November when I interviewed Samoa. So this is an interview I've been holding on to for a couple of months now, but uh, back in November, I spoke with Samala about her practice of helping people integrate their entheogenic experiences via using mindfulness techniques. So that's what we're going to be talking about today here on the Entheogenic Evolution Podcast. But of course, as always, there are a few quick announcements before we get into our conversation with Samala, which I'm sure you will enjoy. First of all, I do want to thank Sasha and Angelica for joining up with a joint membership over at my Patreon page at patreon.com slash Martin W. Ball, who are looking to alternate their one-hour monthly consultations with me with their membership level. Thank you so much for your support and, of course, ongoing continued support, or thanks, I should say, to everyone who has been supporting me over at Patreon. It really makes a huge difference in my monthly nut, as they say. And uh, really deeply appreciate it. And of course, for those of you at the cap and God molecule levels that have a 30-minute and 60-minute monthly consultation or check-in with me, I always enjoy that and look forward to seeing you on my computer screen and speaking with you. Of course, if you'd like to support this podcast and get something back in return, Patreon is a great way to do it. Again, it's patreon.com slash Martin W. Ball. I have everything from $1 a month all the way up to $100 a month, which of course gets you that one hour consultation, along with uh, a t-shirt with my art on it after three months, which, you know, it's pretty cool, I guess. I mean, if, if you like that kind of thing. And a variety of levels in between. So if you want to help support this podcast with a monthly, monthly contribution, you know, a good place to start is $1 a month or $5 a month. $5 a month works out to about a dollar per podcast episode every month. And uh, it's great to have you over there at Patreon. Also, thank you to, let's see, who was it? Uh, Brooke, who makes a monthly contribution via PayPal in support of the podcast. And also David, who made a one-time contribution over this past week. Thank you very much. If you would like to support me with a PayPal donation, that's awesome too. You can stop by my personal webpage at martinball.net and use the PayPal link at the top right of the page. And there's also a link to my Patreon page over there. Um, in other news, I'm actually quite excited to announce that I've released a new book of art. The book is called Avian Art Forms, and uh, the subtitle is Bird Photography and Ethereal Art. And this is a collection of my photographs of birds combined with my art, and therefore avian art forms. Um, so this is a new book uh, for me, and uh, just came out the other week. Has over a hundred pieces of original artwork in there. It's all printed in full color, and I gotta say, you know, having received the proof copy, that the color saturation on the pages is just gorgeous. It's beautiful. Um, I'm really happy with the book. Most of the photographs of the birds are ones I've taken over the past year when I upgraded to a new camera body and a new super telephoto lens. Um, and I just really enjoy making the art. You can check out the art that's in this book as well as my other art at my art webpage. Yeah, I've got a lot of them. So there's the fractal, fractalimagination.com is my art webpage. And, um, there's quite a few images from this most recent art book that are available there. If you want to check them out. Um, let's see what else we got going on. Oh, I don't know if you are aware, but kind of unexpectedly and out of the blue, as far as everybody seemed to be concerned, uh, Australia, the country of Australia, just legalized MDMA and psilocybin for the use of therapeutic purposes to help treat PTSD and chronic depression and treatment-resistant depression. So go Australia. Don't know how that's all going to you know, sort out and work out in the long run, but uh, I think it's an amazing first step by a country. It is the first country in the world to actually say, you know what, we've seen enough evidence. These things work. We're going to use them in therapeutic settings. Of course, we still need to make a lot of progress on the decriminalization front. And of course, religious and spiritual use of entheogens, which has been a big topic here on the podcast as of late, because a lot of that is happening right now. And then of course, we just have individual use and exploration from a secular perspective uh, that I think is also important. But it's amazing the progress that's being made around the world. So 
cool. All right, so let's go ahead and get into the conversation with Samala. Um, Just to let you, the listener, know, there is some interesting, I don't know if interesting is the right word, but there's some feedback that shows up on Samala's side of the conversation that I do not remember being there when we had the interview, so I'm not sure where the feedback came from, but it's there in her audio track. So I've done what I can to remove the silences when you can just hear the hissing, um, that it kind of comes in and out. So I apologize for that, but you know, what are you going to do? It's there. Um, I'm sure you'll enjoy the conversation anyway. Again, it's about integration and mindfulness and just some of Samala's background and how we got to know each other and all of that. And of course, I'll throw another new track of mine at the end of this. I'm going to put in uh, In the In Between, which is one of the tracks from the Pure Energy of Unconditional Love album that I released late last year and is sort of the audio companion to the facilitating 5MEO DMT book because it's the music that I use in the audio book. And of course, all of my books are available in paperback and ebook at various Amazon marketplaces, and many of them are also available in audiobook at Amazon, Audible, and the iBookstore if you want to get any of those. And somebody asked me if my new art book was going to come out in audiobook, and uh, I'm not sure if he was being serious, uh, but I said I have not yet perfected the art of translating images into sound yet, but you know, working on it. I do use a lot of birds in my music, so you know, maybe that's the same thing. And a lot of the birds that I use in my music are from recordings I've made out in the field, just like I take photographs of birds and then put them in my art. So kind of the same thing, sort of, but I don't think I could get away with an audio book of that. Anyway, enjoy. Here's the conversation with Samala. And next week we'll be starting with uh, selections from my medical memoir, A Sleep Story. So... You can look forward to that if like a story of pain and suffering and torment uh, is something you can look forward to, but you know, it is what it is. So here's Samala. Please enjoy here on the Entheogenic Evolution Podcast. Okay. Well, I'm welcoming on to the Entheogenic Evolution Podcast today, Samala, who I think has a very interesting story to tell about her own journey into psychedelic healing and how she went from someone on the receiving end to now someone who is working more on the integration end. And I think it has a lot of fascinating little tidbits for us. And Samala and I have had various connections over at least the the past year, I think. Um, And so Samala, let's uh, go ahead and welcome you onto the show. Thank you so much, Martin. I'm super glad to be here. (laughs) Well, I'm excited to have you here. So Samala, we're going to start with where I usually like to start, and actually maybe I'll even ask you this to be to begin. Have you given any other interviews on this subject before, or is this the very first one? This is my very first one. Okay. Well, welcome to the interview club. <laughs> <then>. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. I've talked about it a lot, but never interviewed. So. Well, I'm honored that your very first interview is right here on the Entheogenic Evolution, and I hope that it becomes a stepping stone for uh, further developments in your future. It's, it's often how it works. So, mm. yeah. Well, but, I know. appreciate being here, and I appreciate your audience because they're probably a lot like me, looking for uh, relief of suffering and just doing a lot of hard work, and, and somehow Entheogenics got involved, and here I am. <laughs> yeah. Well, so let's start with just sort of introducing you. Let, let's get to know Samala a little bit, and then, then we'll get into the psychedelic work. But let's just hear a little bit about who you are and what, your story. Well, it's a, it's a kind of a, a suffering, glamorous story. I think Hollywood would love to get a hold of me, certainly Jerry Springer. I, 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 say, that it, I say that in retro, you know, I can say that in hindsight, but at the time, I probably couldn't have said that. But you know, it was, it's, I'm sure everyone has a story of suffering. Uh, I like to liken suffering to a, a table of suffering that we all take a seat at. And until you draw your last breath, you will always be somewhere seated at the table of suffering. Um, and it's a, I like to envision it as a long table, like a long picnic table where your friends and family are close by. And then the rest of the world is either down to your right or down to your left. Mm. And that you will be seated there. Uh, you'll either be dropped off unceremoniously from a helicopter, metaphor, like it'll just be sudden, all of a sudden, this some, something very sudden and tragic happens, or something, you'll, you'll be 
you'll roller skate there. There's all kinds of ways we get to the table of suffering, but you will all, we'll all be seated. And then what we eat when we get there will be different. Sometimes the, the meal is shoved unceremoniously down our throats. In other words, we don't want to be doing this. Like this, the last thing on earth I want to do is this suffering. And sometimes it's just, you know, nom, you know, nominal sufferings, like someone cut me off in traffic, but I think suffering is such a common theme in the human being's life that for me, it's almost uh, it's almost uh, like opera, like or soap opera style suffering <laughs> that that has been with me since the very beginning of my life. Probably even while I my mother was pregnant with me, um, a lot of um, abuse kind of in my in my past, um, a lot of abandonment, a lot of a lot of then of course that promulgates fear and anxiety, which in turn pump promoted insomnia because my mind wanted to solve solve for x while i was sleeping yeah. and i've been r really working with insomnia for about the last eight years um after a devastating divorce um in 2014 it was literally i was married on a monday i was married for 15 years and on monday this thing happened and on tuesday i was no longer married it's like literally in 24 hours i lost everything my lot my job my house my my pets my clothing my car my marriage was over. And so my brain, of course, like most people's brains, went into overdrive trying to um, see the tiger behind all the bushes. But there was no tiger. But my mind couldn't stop looking for that tiger. It was, um, I think, the human, the human being is geared to go into you know, self-protection mode. That's what, prom you know, that's what perpetuates the species. But when there is no tiger, you know, then we have that, the classic... Um, uh, suffering that we may call depression or anxiety. And so I was really not in a really good way at all and back in 2014, 15. And I was desperate to find an answer. Um, when I came upon meditation, and I had tried meditation before, and it just didn't work. You know, focus on your breath. And for me, it didn't do much. But the second time around with the, with the system of, of techniques that are, I would call, I would refer to as unified mindfulness, I finally started getting a hold of what of the insomnia that the mental chatter in my head that was at a that was just screaming at a 10 like what about this and what about that and it just wouldn't stop and it was really loud it just I finally started being able to manage not just being able to sleep but I was reframing the insomnia to how to just rest mm. just getting rest with the meditation, and then that was four years of working on that, and I was just doing 10 minutes a day, not really doing a heavy meditation like you would think of, you know, monks in a monastery, but at some point in that four-year journey, a friend of mine in Iceland talked to me about one of your guests on the show, um, Nix, who does 5-MeO-D or Bufo in Iceland, and I was heading to Iceland anyway, and, and this person said, you gotta work with her, you gotta work with her, and they knew my story. They knew what I had, been go what I had gone through at home with uh, the abuse and the abandonment, and then, of course, the, the marriage ending the way that it did. And Nix and I talked, and I had no idea, because in my life I had never, I'm not even a drinker, I don't drink alcohol. <laughs> I've never used any drugs in my life, so it was not even on my radar what a psychedelic was. I couldn't even tell you what that word meant, other than it was a drug, right? Mm -hmm. And then I, Nix does some preparation work with me, trying to vet how, you know, what my status is, and then the meeting finally happens, and I tell you, it was probably one of the hardest things that has ever happened to me personally. Like it was in terrifying. It was, but it was so therapeutic. It was both at the same time. And I had, it was so powerful what happened to me, but it was so painful. But it was because of those four years of working with the insomnia and utilizing those unified mindfulness techniques that I was able to navigate this, this tsunami of the psych, my psychedelic experience. And I was able to not only not bail on it, because I, I can totally see why people bailed on it. This was my first experience with psychedelics, by the way. Five, in, the bufo. Not mushrooms, not whatever all the people do when they first start trying them out. This was my first one out of the gate, and it was so powerful. Um, 
but I managed to stay with it and I managed to let it do the work that it needed to do to me because I just presumed it, it knew what it needed to do to me. So I just let it do it, even though it was ugly and it was painful. But because of the skills that I was utilizing from, the, from just working with the insomnia, I was able to stay with it and let it do some serious healing work with me. And I just saw the opportunity to continue down this journey. This was just literally in July of last year when all this started. So I've been very short with this, this whole experience. Yeah. So let me pause you right there. And I want to come back specifically to this Bufo experience with Nix. But I, I want to throw a question um, your way that uh, this was an interesting question that I got asked yesterday. I was doing a consultation with um, someone who is considering working with Bufo or working with 5MEO and doesn't have any experience there. And one of the things that she started with in our consultation was... Um, kind of this interesting point. She said, you know, I've, I've read a lot of spiritual teachers and, and now I'm reading your books and I'm listening to your your materials and and you don't really talk about the value of suffering. Do you see a value in, in suffering? And so she, that was the question she posed to me, sort of from a spiritual perspective. And, and actually I had quite a bit to say about that. But as someone who's been through a lot of suffering and of course, Nobody likes suffering because it's suffering and it sucks. Um, I'm curious, how would you answer that question of, do you see a value in suffering? But how would you answer that? I do now. I don't think I could have said that even at the beginning of my meditation journey. Um, I do now see it because what I've experienced in the psychedelic setting specifically with the DMT families and lately ayahuasca um, at the ayahuasca foundation in, in, um, in Peru was that because the suffering ha has been such a seriously shaping influence in my life it, it, and probably more than anyone would care to have happen. But if it wasn't for the fact that I had this suffering, then I would not know what it's like to be to be free. So my, my value of the freedom from that suffering or the relief of that suffering is so much more, is such a more embodied feeling. It's mm. much more fulfilling. I can feel happiness much more easily because I know, I know how to, I know how to work with the suffering in a much more skillful way because of the meditation techniques and because of the psychedelics. Cause I think there's a nice handshake there between the two. And if it wasn't for the fact that these things had happened to me, I would not have taken the Bufo and I would not have taken all the other things I've done. And I would not have been able to see the difference between my life um, re with the suffering now reframed into sort of like a, tra um, I have, I think I have really learned how to transcend and to tr um, transform the suffering into actual, into compassion, into other things without that suffering Ironically enough, I don't think I would have been able to embrace it so, so, or embody it so, so clearly or so manifest it so, I don't know the word, it's, it's so much more clear to me and so much more evident to me because I understood what suffering was and, and to be able to transcend it in a, such a skillful way, not that it's perfect, but it's certainly skillful, much more skillful than it was 10 or 15 years ago. It's, it has the the relief of suffering means so much more to me and now happiness mm. has taken on other significances of understanding myself at deeper and deeper levels the suffering got in the way of that i couldn't and now i can i have a lot more insight about who i am as a person because of that suffering i have i also now want to serve other people which is also part of happiness now that i see these things about my suffering and i understand that they can be transcended or or transformed that I want to help other people do the same thing. So that suffering sort of was the beginning of me being able to do and see these um, these trans these transformed ways of looking at suffering. Yeah. Well, that sounds like it's had, in its own way, a good impact on on your life. Of course, not that we would ever want to wish suffering on someone so that they can grow or discover more of themselves, but it certainly, it can be a pathway to that. And that sounds like how that impacted you in that 
it spurred you on to these deeper investigations and to do this work with the medicines and to transform that perspective. And there's also just sort of that reality. It's kind of like when you get a cold and you feel crappy for a while. And then when the cold leaves and you realize, oh, I could just breathe, that it gives you just new appreciation for things that you took for granted before. You yeah, know. that's a really good word picture. It really is uh, the transformation of the suffering. It, it's almost it's also nice to know that it's not the end of the story, that the, the suffering was just part of the story. It is absolutely not the end. Um, and I think a lot of us with a ton of um, trauma in our backgrounds, we feel so stuck in, in like it's like a gooey tar that we can't get out of. The, the meditation and then the psychedelics blended with the meditation have made me see that it is absolutely able to be transformed and that is not the end. In fact, it is probably just the beginning, but it is hard work. It is very hard work, but it is so, it's work so worth doing. Yeah. So, you know, here's a place where you're welcome to share what you want. And also, if you just don't want to get into it, that's okay as well. But I really do appreciate the fact that you have pretty much upfront stated that your Bufo session with Nix was really hard. It was scary. It was challenging. It was not an easy experience. And I, I just first, I just want to acknowledge the value of saying that because you know, 5-MeO, Bufo, has a reputation as, you know, the quote-unquote God molecule, and people go into ecstatic states of unconditional love, and, you know, these full-body orgasms, and, you know, all this really beautiful stuff that can happen. And I've always said, also, but also keep in mind, it can be really difficult, it could be really traumatic. So I think it's always important to give a balanced picture, a balanced narrative of whatever it is that we're talking about. And I really appreciate that you've said that it was difficult, it was hard, it was scary, it was not fun, yet you found value in that. So I'm curious if you would be interested in sharing um, just a few more details of, of how that worked for you, specifically how you could encounter something that's so difficult, so potentially terrifying, yet also feeling like, I'm so glad I did that. I'm so glad I went through that because something valuable came out of it. And it kind of relates to that question of the potentially transformative power of suffering. Because working with psychedelics is not all flowers and hearts and rainbows and unicorns at all. Not at all. Yeah. But again, I think people who are drawn to meditation and or psychedelics or both they're on a, we're on a journey of wholeness or wellness and it's it's not an easy road but i think we're i was committed because i was so tired of feeling the way that i felt and bufo being my first ever psychedelic experience i had no idea what i was in for and i don't think any amount of youtubes or or <laughs> any amount of anything would have prepared me for what i was about to face and I think it was precisely because of my training in the, these, these particular mindfulness techniques, I had cultivated enough baseline concentration, sensory clarity, and the crown jewel of the three skills is equanimity. Equanimity means I'm not pushing or pulling, I'm not fighting what's happening. And everyone always says in psychedelics, don't fight what's happening, don't fight what's happening. It's really hard not to fight what's happening. <laughs> Unless I just happened to have three years of training trying to manage the insomnia, which was a byproduct of other suffering. So inadvertently, my having insomnia was the vehicle that got me through the, the intense Bufo experience, which quite frankly was a shit show. I'm going to be honest. It was on in a movie. It was a, in movie terms. It was it was a it was a blockbuster disaster. It was uh, it was not pretty at all what happened to me. But because I still had my three skill sets fairly intact, I knew that if I could just not wrestle with what was happening and not fight it and just go with whatever was happening, which was hard, I would be able to come out on the other end of that and feel the relief of that suffering because what it did to me was pull up so much repressed emotion that I didn't even know I was repressing. Of course, I had some idea of repressing something, but to the extent that it, I had been repressing, I had no clue. 
I thought I was repressing at a one or a two. I was probably on a 12 or a 13 of repression, and the bufo just made this come out in such a volcanic way. Um, but I also heard myself saying, oh, this is interesting. I didn't know you had that much repression in you. Like, I was just <laughs> greeting, I was just able to greet the e extraordinary overwhelm with such equanimity while it was happening. And the way Nix does her sessions, they last pretty long. It's not, you just don't get one, you just don't hit one, The you don't take it once, you take it multiple times. So the session was very long with her, six or seven hours. And it was again and again and again. And I would just use my skill sets to just manage like I thought for a minute, I was going to, I'm like, oh, so this is what it's like to die. I literally had this very calm voice just say, interesting, I don't, I think I might die. But it wasn't panicked. It wasn't freaking out. But the outside, if someone was looking at me from the outside, it would look like I, I was throwing up all over myself. I was screaming my head off. My In between my ears, though, there was this calm voice going, interesting. I've never experienced anything like this. And I would just check with my sensory experience, oh, I do hear the wind outside, I'm still alive, keep going. That's all I was doing, was just kind of checking in with another sensory experience that wasn't directly involved in the, the full boot, the, the body, go, the body um, heavings and the screaming. Check in, oh, you're fine, go back into the, go back on the rocket ship back to outer space because um, that's all I could do, I wasn't, I, and, and for me too, you have to think, I had just traveled to Iceland, I wasn't gonna, <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't like I just went down the street. I made a huge effort to get there, time and money, and I I was really interested in wor really working on this on this suffering. But I didn't know that that's what Bufo would do to me, and it needed to do it because once it was done, six hours later, I felt a lightness and a and a airiness and like a fluffiness, if you will, that I had never felt before in my life. Ah, uh, that's that's really beautiful. Um. Something I, I would like to point out in what you've just described here is really one of these these transformative potentials, particularly of working with something like 5-MeO-DMT that, that just is so energetically explosive and powerful is that, of course, when we are in our suffering, we tend to be trapped and identified with it. So I am the suffering. I am the screaming. I am the crying. There, and there's no way out, right? It traps us because we're so deeply embedded within it. But here through the Bufo experience and your, your equanimity, your willingness to allow, it shows you that actually there's a level of your awareness that is not trapped by that at all. And that actually exists independently of that and then can observe it and I mean, just what an incredible gift. And that's why it has the, the potential for the, the unconscious, the repressed stuff. You can let all that out and it's clearly not you. It's not identified with you. It's just what you've withheld. And just getting that removed as all of this is happening and then being able to observe it and recognize it. And then also, I just love that you were saying that you, you could hear the wind. And so you can also identify, okay, reality is still there. This is what's happening and allowing it to move through. And that these are such key elements of moving through these difficult passages. And even though, of course, different people have suffered at different levels, and some people much more than others, that this is almost a universally true experience, that almost everyone has some kind of repressed energy that they have not encountered fully and they have not released. And, and part of the fear is that it is them, but it's, it's not. Right. A lot of suffering is so personalized, especially that endured as a child. It's so hard for a child to differentiate that it's it's because of me that this is happening. Oh, I'm you know I'm hitting you. It must be because you're such a horrible kid. It's really it it's because our parents are are these adults are not managing their own suffering very well and they're taking it out on us. So we do embody that suffering as somehow it it's us. It's a, it's it's we're identified with the suffering as if it was me and there can be no other solution for me other than this miserable, tormented state of being. And I have to say that I had been to therapy for many, many years and have done, done many, many different type, types of modalities. And I have made more progress with my trauma, if you will, in the last 18 months than I have made in 25 years of seeing a therapist. 
uh, or seeing many therapists because the the meditation paired with the meditation techniques and the building of concentration, sensory clarity, and especially equanimity has allowed me to go on these very tumultuous rides because I now I understand that at the end of the ride there will be relief of suffering and then of course the integration piece has become so much more I can embrace I can connect with that psychedelic experience so much more fully that I if I'm faced with something now in the moment today that's making me fearful because fear is probably my number one um, outcome of, of the trauma I can go back into my mental image space, my mental, my mental talk space, my, my emotional body space, pull that sensation from the psychedelics to right now, this second, and respond to the, the current situation with that memory mm-hmm. and feel it all, see it all, and hear it all as if it was happening right now. Now, it's a taste of it, but it's still enough to get me responding to the, the current fear in a completely different way. But I think your point to that people tend to um, identify so closely with their suffering, you're absolutely right. When you, when these skill sets are built up just enough, they don't have to be perfect, but if they're built up just enough, you can use that to continue to go like, yeah, I'm alive. Everything's fine. You, you hear the wind outside, get back on the rocket and go. <laughs> it's almost like yeah, I stuck my hand out of the window. Like you're, have you ever stuck your hand out of a window of a speeding car and you could just feel that resistance? Yeah. And then you pulled that's what still that's kind of what I did. I was on the rocket, strapped to the outside, hurtling into outer space, <laughs> and I stuck my hand out. And I recognize, okay, you're, you can hear the wind outside in cold Iceland. Bring your hand back in the, into the rocket ship and go again. And I would just do that every now and then over the course of six hours and just check in. And then the, the, the amount of relief, of, of release that I had, not everything got cleared. I did not have a, I'm, I, a godlike experience. I did not have a breakthrough experience. But what I did have was a relief of suffering. I absolutely had that, and it started a path of take of experimenting and trying other other psychedelics. Most recently, um, at the Ayahuasca Foundation with Carlos Tanner's people um, in Peru, and again, all extraordinarily overwhelming um, psychedelic experience. What I saw in my mental image space, what I was hearing in my with, with what I was hearing in my mental chatter space, and what I was feeling in my body all of them being greeted by these three skill sets. And I was like, huh, this is what it's like to die of aspiration. I literally had that thought in my head as I was power puking so hard that I thought I was going to pass out or die. And this little gentle voice said, huh, that's interesting. This is what it's like to die of vomiting. And I, and so, but I wasn't freaked out about it at all. And I was like, okay. Then it just kept coming and kept coming. But then once all that passed at like hour two of the four-hour ceremony, then I could totally sink into that experience and really work with the the curandero down there and just explore this whole space of my suffering. And it was just incredible. But man, it was hard. It was hard, hard AF. (laughs) Okay, there's a couple more elements here that I want to comment on that I think are quite significant and educational for everybody listening. And... um, One of them is just the fact that it's often the case that people who have experienced a lot of trauma and a lot of difficulty, that they are going to need to go through something rather grueling, usually when they start doing their psychedelic work, that they're not going to start with the bliss bomb in most cases, that it's going to take some, you know, some determination to really be able to see it through and go through these very difficult passages of releasing all that crap so that then you can get to the more enjoyable, exploratory, ecstatic end of it. But if we were to just dump you right into the, the, the bliss end of the pool, well, then that's just another form of bypassing and it just becomes another attachment. So it, it, there really is this value, kind of going back to that idea of suffering, that in this case, there is value in going through the suffering because it does need to be released. And another important aspect of the story that you're sharing here is that in committing yourself to go through this six or seven hours with Nix, because th- this is a place sometimes where people, they start and then they realize, oh man, this is really hard. Uh, can we stop? I want to go home. 
Um, that's a choice that, of course, people can make, but you didn't do that. So you chose to see it all, all the way through to the end of that session with her. And, and that's always what I like to see. Then, you know, that's, and you know this because we've had our conversations that I always say, look, the most important thing in any psychedelic session is that you get to a point of completion for that process for that day, which also, just like in your case, doesn't mean you're done forever. It means you went through that passage, you completed that energy so that you reached the point where you felt lighter, where you felt freer, where you felt renewed, but then still being honest with yourself, recognizing there's still more, so I'm going to continue the work. And that's what brought you to the Ayahuasca Foundation. And this, this is exactly what we want to see that it is this commitment to kind of going through this difficult process and at some point it will become better it will become easier but we've got to get the gunk out of the way first and and that's a, something that a lot of people even if they sometimes people like verbally say yeah I really want that but when they're actually confronted with the reality of what that means it's so overwhelming and terrifying that they back away but as you say these um this tripod that you mentioned of, of um, equanimity. Uh, what were the other ones? So it was... uh, it, the three skills are concentration, sensory clarity, and equanimity. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Equanimity being the crown jewel. I, I think what I would say to people is suffering. If you, you're going to suffer. If you're until you die and draw your last breath, you are going to suffer. If not, let's look at your watch and if give it a few, give it some time. <laughs> it's coming. Yeah. So t pick your heart. Pick your heart of either being stuck in that quagmire of the suffering and everything that goes along with it, the, the anxiety, the depression, the low self-esteem, and, and, and. Or pick the heart of understanding yourself more as a sensory, as a sensory system, understanding your the ability to concentrate, ha which sense gate is this thing coming at me? Is it predominantly in my mental image, mental chatter space, body sensations? And then apply as much equanimity as you can, knowing that the, the, the payoff is you're going to take the next step away from this, this transfixed, contracted ball of suffering. You're going to start expanding out. But pick your, they're both hard. Pick your heart. Yeah. But you can be prepared for it if you want to do something about it and holistically approach the psychedelic experience. Be prepare for it. Um, navigate during it, and then uh, certainly integrate taking those downloads you got or anything you learned into the present day moment, then there's something that can be done about that. But we're going to suffer. So let's pick which way we want to work with it. <laughs> For me, the answer was clear. I was so tired of feeling the way that I felt. I was willing to do anything, including something that was not in my wheelhouse. Meditation was not in my wheelhouse. And definitely psychedelics was not in uh, my radar until this experience with Nix, which was a kind of a side door. Like I didn't even know what I was really getting into. Um, and I'm glad I didn't know exactly what I was not, what I was getting into because I might've said no. <laughs> it was sometimes ignorance is bliss, but the ride was so hard. It was so challenging, but at, in the end or towards the end, like the fifth hour into the sixth hour, I felt like a completely different person. And I knew now that this was not the, this trend, this very, balled up state of suffering, like this black ball of gross yuck had started to loosen up and I could feel that. And so now there's other work I need to do now. I need to be able to start working on the edges, understand myself at deeper and deeper levels, keep going. It was just the beginning, but it was a, such a wonderful way to really understand that that suffering is not going to be the final determiner of who I am as a person, which it often is for people. It is, we identify so closely with it. And we even die, you know, we have a patho we have a patho pathology language. I have depression, I've been clinically diagnosed, I have anxiety, which all those things are me too, but they're not me as much anymore, if at all. But the work continues and probably will continue for the rest of my life because suffering is just around the corner. But it's, I'm going to be greeting it with a much more different, um, much more different attitude and a much more different... Um, set of skills of, I know I'm going to, I'm going to handle it differently now. It's not going to be perfect. It'll just be different. Yeah. So, um, I'd like to ask you more about your time at the, the ayahuasca foundation. I'd like to hear that. But, um, bef before I do, I just, 
I really want to share with the audience sort of the the chain of connection because I just think it's always so fascinating. I mean, it's a big world, but it's also it's not that big a world. So I'll start with, um, you know, I, I've had a couple interviews with Nix on the podcast. And the second one that I did, we had Helgi and Nix. So Helgi is a musician and DJ who lives in Iceland. And he and I have had kind of a casual um, conversation ongoing for the past several years. He, he first reached out to me, um, like asking if I would make weird vocal sounds on one of his tracks. Okay. So he, he just kind of got in touch with me. And then at some point, Helgi said, Hey, this, this five MEO facilitator is going to be moving in with me and working here in Iceland. And then it was shortly after that, that you contacted me and said, Hey, I, I just experienced Bufo in Iceland and I'd like to talk to somebody about it. And then right after that, um, I actually did get in touch with Nix herself and then had Nix on the show. And then, um, I was contacted by Carlos Tanner at the ayahuasca foundation and had him on the show. And then I believe you heard Carlos on the show and then you ended up in um, South America. So it's just this interesting string of connections. Um, so that's how you, that's, you know, ostensibly speaking, that's how you ended up at the um, Ayahuasca Foundation. But I'm curious, uh, you've told us a little bit about, you know, sort of the epic vomiting that you did there. Um, but it, I'd be very interested just to kind of hear um your thoughts, feelings, and impressions of the Ayahuasca Foundation as someone who came uh, as a client, as, as a patient, because we, of course, I've had Carlos on the show a couple times now um, for, to have his description of it. But I'm curious, what would you say from the other side of being a recipient? Well, I have to say the first thing that struck me immediately, especially after the very first session, the very first night we got there, that... I was blown away by the the involvement of the, the curandero, the shaman. I, I think that's what sets ayahuasca apart, is that this shaman is involved in your experience. And it, at least for me and for many of my, my part, co-participants, I was stunned. And again, I greeted it with equanimity. I was like, huh, that's interesting, versus what the fuck is he doing in my mental image space? <laughs> I, 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 after the power puking was over and almost passing out and almost like not, I didn't even know what day it was. I, I was completely sideways for like the first hour of the first session. But at length, when all of that finally passed, I was just amazed that I could hear him 30 feet away from me directly because he was, we were in a circle in the Mayoka, the, the build, the, the structure where ayahuasca is served. He was directly across from me. He was at 360, I'm at 180. And I could hear him 30 feet away in my ears. But in my mental image space, he was sitting at the edge of my bed with his legs crossed and all of his energy beaming out. His eyes were shut and his mouth was shut. And he was pulling something from me. I could feel the sensation of a pull, mm. something leaving me, and I could feel something coming back. So some sort of elliptical pattern happening between him and I. And I know he's not sitting Literally, he's not sitting at the edge of my bed. He's still across the Mayoka. And this pull, push, pull, push, and I could see him. And I was like, I was like, wow, that's interesting. I've never seen anybody in my mental image space like that before. And I just let him keep doing it. And then when he was done, he threw up. Mm. And I'm like, mm. he, he took all that. I could tell he was taking this yeah. stuff from me. The other facilitators did it to me, too, and I even confirmed with them, like, were you focused on me during the session? Oh, yeah, I was totally focused on you. And, uh, and same thing, they were pulling something from me, giving me something back, and then they threw up when they were done. And I was like, this is unbelievable. I've never experienced interacting with another human being like this on such an energetic level. It was, it was incredible. And it was, and talk about being helped. Like we all, I want to help people. You help people, Martin. If it wasn't for your podcast, it would be so many. All of us learn so much from how much you're you're um, elevating all of our awareness. We're all helping in different ways, but being helped by the shaman in a curandero in a in an ayahuasca ceremony was beyond 
belief. Like I never thought someone could help me like mm-hmm. that. And lo and behold, there he was uh, again and again and again in my mental image space, taking stuff from me. Um, it was just incredible. And uh, every session was, uh, I learned something new about my suffering. I learned something new about myself. I learned something new about, about of the questions of the universe, and I, I couldn't hold it all and download it all, but I got enough to be able to move forward again in my life now that I'm back in regular consciousness and back in my normal routine. Those lessons and those images that I got, um, even my my hearing was altered, and my um, I felt like a tuning fork at some times. I was complete, I felt like I was vibrating on such a high energy, like I was going to shake right off the bed. Um, so many interesting things happened to me in my sensory experience, but instead of freaking out about them, I was just like, huh, well, that's interesting, and I just would keep going with them. That was the equanimity, the, the skill set of equanimity, which enabled me to see the, the session all the way through to the end, even though I was like, God, I don't want to throw up like that anymore. <laughs> it was so, I swear, I thought I was going to pass out or die from aspiration. They, I've never vomited like that before. But the, I asked the, one of the facilitators, they're like, well, yeah, there's a lot of repression still there. And I'm like, darn it, I thought the 5-MeO took care of some of that. Oh, no, no, there's more. <laughs> it, it was just the beginning. The 5-MeO was just the beginning. Yeah, so it just took the cork off. It took the cork off. Plenty of work to still do. But because I'm so motivated to not be having suffering dominate my entire existence and, and be the lens through which I see the world, I was like, I'll, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll do whatever it takes. And within, obviously within reason, I'm not going to like, you know, jump off a building or anything, but I will do whatever I have to do within the psychedelic, um, the psychedelic uh, scenario to accomplish, to move the needle forward a little further than it was where the day before. Yeah. So something I'd like to highlight here is this idea of that when you're really consciously working on this, you know, versus, you know, I'm taking mushrooms and I'm going to go dance at the Grateful Dead or whatever. Um, but when you're, when you're really in it, in the process of, look, I am looking to transform myself that in my experience, um, one psychedelic will build off of what the one before it did and that they are sequential and that they are related to each other. And that I I also, even though I'm a big proponent of 5-MeO DMT, I also do tend to advise work with as many different psychedelics as you can, as you're going through this process, because each one has a different energetic presentation and a different way of working with you. And especially in this context, I think you got to learn the power of, you know, that the shamans, the curanderos, that someone who, someone who really is a facilitator, someone who's really a practitioner, that actually they are involved in your process. They do make a big, big difference that it's not just you having your experience, but this person is working with you. They are transforming energy for you. They are purging it out for you. They are replacing it with something cleaner and smoother. Um, So these are all very interesting highlights of your own experience. It's a perfect example of all of these things. Um, And I'm curious how you would then describe, so with your your six to seven hours of Bufo with uh, Nyx, that you came out feeling lighter and cleaner. Um, Ayahuasca, you had just the endless, endless vomiting. Um, But how do you feel in terms of the time period that you spent there? What changed for you from the beginning to the end and, and when you left. Um, in other words, how would, how would you describe what it brought to you next in your own process? I think the word process is what's coming to mind. This is still an, a, a, a WIP, W-I-P, a work in progress. I think, I think it's like a giant puzzle. I've, I've, I've put together a lot of pieces, and I, there's uh, some primary critical pieces have been put into place or, rem- or removed. They were the wrong pieces. And it's still, it's still a work in progress. I think what's prob- what I'm sensing now, what's next for me in the process, is that um, now that some of this, tr- this, this repression is out of the way and I'm processing and I'm, and I'm transforming the, the, the trauma and the suffering in different ways, I'm understanding myself at deeper and deeper levels, I'm seeing finally some with the world with a little bit more clarity that is not shrouded by the, the, the visor of suffering. Mm. 
who is it to, what does it mean to be me? What are the things that I like to do? What's really, you know, like I'm like, do I want to still work for corporate America? Do I want to start my, you know, start my own business? Do I want to, what do I want to do that's going to be more in line with this new person that's emerging out of all of this? So there's a whole other branch, kind of like the, the equine person was saying, just really walking in that authentic self because now I can see her a lot more clearly. I can see this person a lot more clearly where I couldn't see it before because suffering was such a prevailing, a prevailing theme in my life. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting how with, with suffering and also just day to day life, like sometimes when confronted by the question of, well, what is my authentic self? What do I really want? That sometimes people just don't have an answer for that. But it sounds like now you might not have, have the full answer, but you're at least you're at a position to even contemplate that and understand kind of viscerally the difference between who you were before that couldn't even ask that question and didn't know that there was an answer there. And now living in a place where you can say, well, what is really authentic for me? And what do I want to do? Because, and that's such a different question than how do I get out of suffering is what do I want to do? Where do I want to apply my focus? Where do I want to apply my energy? What can I contribute? I mean, it's such a different way of living than, oh, poor me, life is terrible. It's so hard and fucking sucks. Why'd you do this to me, God? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, it really, when you're, with the level of trauma that I, we, that my entire family experiences kids, you're in constant um, survival mode. Yeah. There is no opportunity to ask, you know, what would you like to do? What would you like to be if you grew up? There were no questions like that asked of us as children. There was no opportunity to explore our particular bends in the world. We were in constant survival mode. Even after I left the house and the, the threat of being injured was no longer uh, a, a, an issue, mentally and emotionally, I was still in self-defense mode, right? Yeah, the now patterns that had that, been established. The patterns had been well established and, and now that there's been such a breakup of the repression starting with the Bufo in, 20, in, last, in last year, 18 months ago or so, and now other psychedelics I've been using because of your advice, and then now lately the ayahuasca, it's starting to open up this, this venue of, well, who are you? And what would you like to be doing? Which is a question I never could have, I never had the luxury of asking myself because I was in literal danger. And then once that stopped, I was in the, the, the tigers around the corner danger, even though the tiger may not have really been there. So it was a very limiting experience, living, very limiting way of being, which suffering and trauma usually does to us. But it doesn't have to be that way. It certainly um, is not trans it's not fixed like this is not you fixed forever. It can break up. There is potentiality there for um, movement and an expansion of that of that existence that's so contracted from tra from trauma. Yeah. So now in exploring these questions, um, and that's part of what has inspired the the interview today and this conversation is the desire to help others and to help others integrate and help others navigate and perhaps share some of these um, unified mindfulness tools um, to help people through their own psychedelic transformations. When did that seed start to germinate within you and start to cultivate it for yourself to, to bring it into action? No, that's a great question. Um, I think I've already mentioned briefly that I started the meditation out of pure desperation in 2018 when I was having horrible insomnia from the divorce. And I, I, just like many people who come to meditation and psychedelics, they both have that in common. People come, a lot of people come to meditation for, because they're looking for relief of suffering. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that when I, I, the person that I asked or that I met who would be te my teacher was a unified mindfulness coach. And she was helping me understand myself more as a sensory, as a sensory system and really understanding the, the role meditation can play and not just getting to sleep but more resting because I needed to at least be able to rest, which I was able to do. But what I didn't know was that those same skill sets that I was using to, na to navigate a whole other set of suffering um, uh, outcomes, the insomnia and worry and fretting and anxiety, 
were the same exact skill sets that I would need to navigate the intensity of the first booth, the first psychedelic experience I'd ever have in my life with Nix in Iceland. So what turned out to be like, I had no idea that those skill sets would come in handy. And there was a tremendous handshake that the things that I was learning from, from unified mindfulness, the concentration, the sensory clarity, and again, the crown jewel of them all, the learning how to cultivate equanimity would be how I would prepare for any future psychedelic experience. I would then use those same skills to navigate it, and I would use those same skills again to integrate it on a, in, in a more holistic manner versus hoping against hope about integration. Because I hear, I hear that all the time. you got to integrate, got to integrate. Okay, good. How? How do I do that? <laughs> Uh, it, and it just so happens that UM is very suited to this. I don't think it did it on purpose, but it's because it does those three skill sets of concentration, sensory clarity, and equanimity. Um, those things that happen during a psychedelic experience are sensory events. You are seeing things, you are hearing things, you are feeling things externally in your immediate environment and internally in your mental chatter space, your mental image space, your emotional body space. Having understanding about that in normal consciousness, just everyday life, understanding yourself like that, and then using those skills for when you have this like, giant experience psychedelically, and then using those same skills to do to, to do the integration, to me is that is another tripod. So the tripod of preparation, navigation, and certainly integration, and then using them in between to manage normal consciousness because that's where we are most of the time. And it just it started with the insomnia, the horrifying <laughs> insomnia, which you know a lot about. Yes. Um, but learning how to, um, learning how to reframe my, like, just like reframing suffering, reframing um, sleep to rest using meditation techniques would turn out to be the vehicle that helped me um, stay with these incredibly challenging, but beautifully, beautifully challenging <laughs> psychedelic experiences i'll just say that they're beautifully challenging but i don't think i could have i think i can totally see why people bail on those such on those on those um experiences they're ter it was terrifying but i think i had just enough concentration sensory clarity and just enough equanimity to just go like huh like i became the observer of it it's like huh that's interesting i've never felt that feeling before and i i would just could keep, keep going and it wasn't it it keep it kept me from freaking out and it kept me staying with it to the point where I actually could feel the benefit of it, but it was, you know, hours later, but it still came. And it and I to me in my mind, I've been working with the suffering for so long. It's okay. I'll I'll go through six hours just to see what's what's at the end of this road. But I think the skill set of those three skill sets from UM really helped me put it into perspective and helped me become the observer of it versus the reactor to it. Yeah. It's very different mindset. Okay. Well, maybe let's, let's unpack some of this uh, a little bit more and kind of starting with this idea that there is this idea of meditating and using psychedelics to enhance your meditation. So for example, um, you know, the, the bridging heaven retreat that was featured here on the podcast and actually that, that team, they're going to come back on and we're going to do another interview to talk about how their first retreat went and what they're doing for the next one, which did involve microdosing of five MEO and interspersed with meditation and sometimes at the same time. So we have that idea of, well, I'm going to sit and meditate and I'm going to augment it with a little bit of psychedelics. Um, but kind of what you're describing here is different. And at least from what I'm hearing, it's taking the tools from meditation and not looking at the psychedelic experience as a quote unquote meditation, but using the tools within the experience in order to help maintain that equanimity, that removed witness that is allowing this unbelievable psychedelic process to take place. Um, but it's not quote unquote, a meditation. So maybe if we could start with, um, let's just talk a little bit more about the focus, what's meant by that, S the sensory, sensory clarity. And I mean, you, you've already mentioned these things, but I think if we just kind of just mention each one individually, um, so the, what was it? The focus, 
sensory awareness and then the equanimity. Equanimity. Yes. Yeah. So concentration, the 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 three skills that we teach, and they they were present in all all meditation techniques. They're just not necessarily called that. But they're present in all meditation techniques. We just go out, this unified mindfulness just kind of makes emphasis on it, that that's the skills we're building. Concentration is exactly what it says. Where you, can, you can choose to concentrate on any particular one of your sense gates, seeing, hearing, feeling. Um, you can choose, you, and you can concentrate on it for as little or as long as you'd like. Sensory clarity is being able to tell the difference between my see in or my, my, and my see out or my hear out, what I hear with my ears and what I'm hearing in my mental talk space and feel in what I'm feeling in emotionally versus what I'm feeling like I feel the temperature in the room or the, my, the clothes on my body. So sensory clarity, because a lot of our uh, emotional overwhelm is that all of our senses are, are a jumble and they're all landing on each other and we can't tell what from what. Where we, when you can separate them out, seeing, hearing, from feeling and other sensory experience, you can then put, you can focus on the one you'd want to if you'd like and put the others in background because you're choosing to focus on, like for me, I want to focus on the curandero that's sitting at the edge of my bed even though my eyes are closed. I chose to focus on that and kind of put the other sensory experiences in the background. But I could have toggled between them all too. I could, But I was aware which one was which versus being completely overwhelmed by all of them. Yeah. Equanimity then is just building up this idea, this build, building up the skill of not pulling or pushing on your sensory experience. So if something's extremely overwhelming, you're not you're not maximizing it, but you're also not minimizing it. You're just staying with it where exactly where it's at, even if it's intense. You're not making it more than it is. So that skill of being able to see a curandero sitting at the edge of my bed, pulling something from me. I just said, huh, that's interesting, instead of, that was my equanimity coming out. And so these three skills, being able to concentrate on what I chose to concentrate on, being able to tell which sense gate it was coming in, and then being able to just equanimize whatever I was able to detect or wanted to, de to focus on, was what got me through all of these. And so it's, I was using the skill sets of the meditation, but I wasn't necessarily meditating. Um, so that's probably a very accurate, very accurate observation on your part, Martin, because it is, it is so I could have meditated. Um, in fact, probably towards the end, I was probably more in a meditative mm. state focusing on one, but to navigate the experience, I was using all of the skills to get me through it so that I could stay with it. Yeah. So then post psychedelic session, how does this work with the much vaunted and valued uh, integration piece. So as, if we agree that everything in life is a sensory event, if you, you are talking to each other, I see you, I can hear you, um, I, you can feel the chair that you're sitting on, you're also able to do those same things. So, and then it, it doesn't matter if it's a psychedelic experience, it's still also a sensory event, except it's just very magnified. You're seeing things you've never seen before, feeling things you've never felt before, hearing things you've never helped, um, heard before, either inside yourself or outside. So if normal consciousness is a sensory event as well, I'm brushing my teeth, I'm, 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 walk, you know, I'm, I'm cooking food, if we're able to, to concentrate on what's happening, uh, like let's say I, I, one of the things that happened to me that was very significant was this pulling out that I felt the curandero doing to me and how after he was done, this kind of, this kind of cleanliness, I don't know how else to describe mm -hmm. it, there was this feeling of lightness, kind of like the bufo but different. When I'm feeling now in normal consciousness to integrate, what I'm what to me integration is pulling that old the sensory event I experienced in the psychedelic experience into the, the present moment. I'm just pulling. A, I'm just doing a pull forward. So now when I feel um, any kind of nervousness or this thing is kind of not this thing that's happening at work is bothering me. I'm able to literally go back in my see, hear, feel in space. I can see him in my mental image space sitting at the edge of my bed. I can feel that pull that he did for me. And I can feel how I felt after he was done, this kind of lightness. And I can do this in about 20 seconds. And I can now respond to this current moment situation of 
of concern, you know, whatever's bothering me at work or someone said something mean to me. And I can pull that into the moment and respond with that as my lens of this calm, of this peace, and now use that as my response pattern versus just like, what the hell, you know, what I would have normally done in a, in a situation that would have aggravated me. So I'm just using the sensory experience of the see, hear, feel, or the whatever, the concentration, the sensory clarity from what happened at the psychedelic experience and putting it right in front of me for the new experience that's happening in everyday life. So to me, I'm integrating because now I'm responding completely differently because I'm able to pull that sensory experience forward into everyday life. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, yes it does. So you're using that recall in a sense to recreate, to allow you to respond differently to something in the present that might have triggered old patterns, old repressions, old fears, old traumas. And it's interesting how there's actually a parallel with certain forms of of talk therapy that might advise like, okay, well, if you're stressed, imagine a place that's really peaceful for you. And there's a, there is a little bit of power in that, but I think that what you're talking about here of actually, well, I'm taking this really sort of otherworldly experience from psychedelics and bringing it in that, in other words, you know, someone who's had a lot of trauma or anxiety or whatever it may be, that they might have a very difficult time imagining a safe, secure, peaceful place or even getting access to that emotion and that sensory feeling because maybe they've never had it. So it's just kind of an illusion and it doesn't really work. But here, because you went through it, and I think very importantly, the focus. I think the focus is very, very important in order to be able to recall it later. Because, of course, without The concentration, fo- you mean? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, the concentration. concentration. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. then it's not just a jumble of, well, yeah, a bunch of weird shit happened to me in my psychedelic experience and I can't really, I can't Big, even talk about it. Bingo. Yeah. I can focus on whatever I choose to that makes, that brings that forward to me and then put it in, put it in me as if it just happened. And then respond to that, this current day um, sensory event, someone pissed me off. I can now feel all of that, and now I can respond differently. It's not perfect, but it is so much better than what it used to be. <laughs> but it works. I can do it. I, I had a, um, we had a hurricane come through here in Florida last month, and you know we, it was a Category 4, and of course it's very nerve-wracking. And I was able to pull forward um, this uh, another event that happened in the psychedelic experience in I- at the Ayahuasca Foundation. And I was able to just navigate those few days of what were, am I going to have a house? Am I going to have I lost my car? All of that was just kind of like, okay. I mean, again, my normal baseline sensory clarity and equanimity and, and, um, and concentration were already there. But I was able to pull forward another event from the ayahuasca foundation into the hurricane situation and i was able to respond much more calmly to a category four hurricane which is no laughing matter (laughs) it you you want to have wisdom when you're dealing with a category four but i did you don't have to i do i the old me might have gone into freak out mode yeah which so, I, but I didn't. I did not. I was able to respond very differently to this hurricane, and I knew that this was working. <laughs> this is working. <laughs> well, that, that's fantastic. I mean, it, it's such a such a great example of you know something that it might be hard to put those two together to think about how yeah my my making it through my psychedelic experience really helped me with um, the hurricane. <laughs> You know, that you, we wouldn't normally reach those conclusions. Um, it's kind of like how the the person who first facilitated 5-MEO with me um, actually had an elk crash through his windshield. And the, the paramedics and, the, you know, the firefighters who arrived at the crash scene said, like, dude, you really should be dead. Like, we do not understand how you survived. And he said, well, I just treated it like... Uh, I had just taken a hit of 5-MeO yeah, and I just, I just surrendered and the, you know, I don't know what happened to the elk, but you know, it came in and he was okay. You know, he was, he had a few scratches, but yeah, everybody thought he should have died and he attributed it to that. 
Yeah, I think for, you know, when you think it's a hurricane, it's, it was more the fear, the panic of not being able to control an mm-hmm. outcome, which is a which was a huge um, uh, outcome of trauma for me, not being able to anticipate disaster, which a hurricane certainly would spur that 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 trigger that up <laughs> because you don't know what it's going to do, how your house is going to handle it. Are you going to, you know, are you going to die because people die in hurricanes? The unknown is a huge, was part of hurricane life, her life in Florida. So it wasn't so much the hurricane, but all of the what ifs mm, yeah. that I would that I would drown in. In, in hurricane season is is not fun for me because you never know which hurricane is going to take you out. But this last hurricane, and usually if it's a one or two, I don't care. But threes and fours get my attention. This was a four, almost a category five, and I was able to just. B- go back to the to a ceremony, pull up a, a, a mental image of, I could recall how I felt in my body and I could hear what I heard myself say during that ayahuasca ceremony and I put it right in front of me during the hurricane and I responded to it in an almost completely different manner. Now, it's not automatic. I have to do the work of this kind of pulling up yeah. this integration, which is fine, but it's worth it because I was so proud of myself that it did not respond to the hurricane uh, and again category fours are no joke um it was a completely different outcome for me so that was a nice clue for me that this is the, ay- the ayahuasca was helping and the integration was well in hand yeah so then following the seed of inspiration of wanting to share these tools with others to help people prepare for navigate integrate um so where are you in that process? So I was so impressed by Unified Mindfulness's um, ability to help me reframe my insomnia and uh, many other things, but predominantly the insomnia that I be I enrolled in uh, their coaching program and I eventually enrolled in their teacher training program. So I am now officially a teacher of the UM system. And because I also am using psychedelics for my own personal wellness journey, wholeness journey. I have been helping others who are um, the psychedelic community where I live. There are people who are, are also using, it's, it's becoming more and more accepted that people are using psychedelics to, to work with, on their trauma and mm-hmm. I'll get on their wholeness journey. And so I am working with students. Uh, I call everyone students and not clients because we're all in learning mode, myself included. And I'm helping them incorporate the unified mindfulness techniques of these meditation techniques into their into a daily practice prior to taking the psychedelic. And then if they want me to trip sit with them, I will. So because I can engage with them with the same techniques and then we use the same techniques after. So I am now using this with people, me being the number one, (laughs) the number one student. Like it's stuff I'm doing for myself and I'm helping people now do that um, so that they can find their relief of suffering and understand themselves at deeper and deeper levels and, and have more and navigate the world more skillfully. So how did you at the practical level step into doing that? As I mean, this is sort of another potentially interesting question for people. Cause there's lots of people out there saying like, I'm being transformed by my psychedelic work. I want to contribute. I want to get involved. I don't know how, I don't know where to start. So how did you introduce yourself to the community and, and start to offer this? Like what did that look like? It was actually um, something you told me in one of our in one of our meetings together is, um, to reach out to a, a, a psychedelic community where I live, and I did, and I introduced myself and I said what I do, and I told the the woman who runs the community the meetup what I do, and she said I said if there's anyone who needs help, let them send them to me, and sure enough, she started sending people to me because they were tough cases, they were very trauma that would break your heart if you heard their stories it would just it's heartbreaking but we're we're willing to try psychedelics to see if we could start chip you know chipping away at this block this you know this you know this black hole of of of, uh suffering and it's worked out really really well i mean i'm working with people that i they are they're they're so on their way their wellness journey they have they have they are transforming their suffering as well um, it's not done. It's probably with lifelong work, but they are not the same person I met um, when we first started working together. With the combination of of the of the techniques, the unified mindfulness techniques, uh, and the psychedelics, 
they are they are moving in ways that that are just amazing. And it, again, it, psychedelics are not for everybody. You really have to know yourself. But if someone's willing to do the work and they want us, they want to do something about the preparation and have more confidence about the navigation and know how to integrate a little bit in more in ways that are more meaningful to them. I'm 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 the person. I'm, I can help. I can help, and I want to help because I know how much it's helped me. Yeah. So. I would invite you now just to share with us how this has been fulfilling for you, because it does sound like it's very fulfilling. It is very fulfilling. I mean, just watching, we all see the mirror dimly, right? We all don't have a 100% accurate picture of ourselves. But when I handled the, the, the hurricane the way I did and other, other triggers, if you will, I know that I'm, I'm on my way, but it's different for me to see it with the person that I'm working across the, the Zoom screen with or sitting face to face with. Six months later, seven months later, they are a different person. And it's like this, bloss this blossoming flower that was thought it was just mm. stuck and trapped in its suffering is now seeing that there's way more wiggle room than they thought. And there's much more chance of expansion versus contra the contracting nature of suffering. And it's a beautiful thing to see. It's a beautiful thing to see. And um, I wish I could share it with everybody. But even if you don't want to take psychedelics, even before I took psychedelics, it, the, the meditation techniques were helping me um, change. I just think the psychedelics accelerated it for me. Like they put me on a path of acceleration that I could never have anticipated. But I, I was ready for the ride because I had the skill set to get me to keep me moving forward versus going stalling out or going backwards. Yeah. And it sounds like it's nourishing your heart. Oh, it's a beautiful thing to see. Um, it's a, it's, it's incredibly encouraging and, and it, it really just gives me hope in humanity that we're, we're those of us who've suffered. I mean, we have all suffered, but those of us who had like really acute trauma, especially in childhood or, you know, at one and two years old and onwards, that that's not the end of the story. And I think that's just so encouraging and so inspiring to see people really breaking out of that, that limiting, those limiting beliefs that the trauma did to all of us. Yeah. Wow. Well, we've really covered uh, a lot of very interesting territory in our conversation, uh, Samala. Is there anything else that you feel that I haven't asked you about that's um, significant to mention here or any um, final thoughts that you'd like to share with us? Um, I mean, if anyone wants to know about unified mindfulness, they can go to the unifiedmindfulness.com website. If they want to know more about the, the, the gentleman who created it, I, cause I'm not taking credit for that at all is this is not, none of these are my ideas named Shinzen Young. He, you can find him at shinzen.org. Um, uh, it's, it's really an interesting, it's, it's a nice tech. I would like to call it the handshake between meditation techniques and the psychedelic experience has been so amazing. I don't know what I would have done without it. I don't know if I could have handled the overwhelm. And I just want to encourage people that if it's something you're thinking about doing and you want to do something about it, you want to be more proactively involved in the preparation and the navigation and the, certainly the integration, to, to check it out and give it a try. Um, I also have a website where you, people can reach me if they want to talk to me about it as well. But um, meditation, whatever you choose, I think, um, will help. Um, I just think somehow UM is uniquely suited because it took the mist, the mystery out of the mysticism and made it, it's, it's backed by neuroscience. It's very, it's a very systematic approach to meditation. And it, it's, it's, um, you don't have to be wearing a yellow robe and shave your head and go to a monastery to do it. You can, you can do the practices while you're brushing your teeth. That's what I love about it. You can do it on the go. You can do it in your, you can do it in your bed. You can do it anywhere you want for 30 seconds to three hours or three days or three years, you can do what you want. But when you're building up those three skills of concentration, sensory clarity, and equanimity, it really opens up the door to seeing yourself in, in a whole new light. Beautiful. So what is your website where people can find out more about you and contact you? Um, uh, www.ecologiesofmindfulness.com. Ecologies of Mindfulness, all spelled out. Um, uh, just because there's all kinds of ecologies in mindfulness. Like I do, I help people with insomnia. I also had a, I had some serious injuries. I used the mindfulness techniques to help me um, stay away from the pain meds and use the mindfulness techniques to manage the recovery of the, of the surgeries and stuff like that. And especially the psychedelic experience um, for people who are 
curious and really wanting to know how to make the most of it and really capitalize on those gains that you, you definitely can get in the psychedelic experience. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing of your own story, Samala, and sharing of these tools and how they're applied and being willing to use yourself as an example for the rest of us to hear and learn from. Uh, it's very deeply appreciated. And it's, it's just a joy to be with you here now on this side of the conversation, um, reflecting back on where we started and the connections that brought us there. And, you know, it's, it's just, it's awesome to have someone who first came to me as a, a client and now as a guest on my podcast. And it's, it's just a pleasure. It's an honor. And I just really want to acknowledge the value of your work and your path and just hope the best for you and all of your students, as you mentioned, um, and just continuing to develop the, these tools and these pathways forward to help everyone just lead a happier, more authentic and freer life. I mean, that's just the wish for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like I said, um, psychedelics really was a game changer for me, but um, the handshake with these meditation techniques is making it so rich. That's a, such a rich experience, even though they've been dreadfully difficult, but <laughs> so, so rich and so meaningful. I can't even begin to tell you. And I thank you for all the work you're doing and the help you provide all your listeners because celebrating that they're they're coming to you looking for the relief of their suffering too probably <laughs> yeah 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 all right well i think that that's good for today what do you think all right yeah i think so thank you so much for the time and uh, uh i really appreciate it all right thank you samala you're welcome